All right, take your Bibles and open them to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. We're almost done with Mark chapter 6. And tonight we reach perhaps one of the most well-known stories in all of the Gospels. Now, obviously, the feeding of the 5,000 is also very popular, but this is one of those well-known stories that you often learn if you grow up in church as a little kid. This is the story of Jesus walking on the water. By show of hands, who knows the story of Jesus walking on the water? All right. This is perhaps one of the most well-known stories throughout the Gospels, but what's interesting is this is the most, in my experience, the most misapplied stories in all of the Gospels. If you want a test case for how not to read the Bible, you should go online and listen to a bunch of sermons on Mark 6, 45 through 52, the story of Jesus walking on the water. You see, what happens oftentimes is when people study this text, they, what's called, they do what's called spiritualizing. They spiritualize the text, meaning uh, something that is meant to be a literal thing, like a boat, becomes a metaphorical thing or a figurative thing. So let me give you an example. If I was going to teach this passage, I think wrongly, I would say, hey, you guys, like Peter, you need to get out of the boat. You know what the boat represents in your life? It's those limiting beliefs, those limiting beliefs that are holding you down, that are keeping you in the storm. You need to step out of the boat and you need to, here's the phrase, you need to walk in the miracle. You need to walk out of the boat, out of the limiting beliefs. You need to pursue God's best for you. You need to step out of the boat just like Peter. I think that is a wrong way to read this passage. Or perhaps uh, you would hear something like, um, Jesus always wants to deliver you from the storm. Jesus could never allow, I guess, something bad to happen in your life. He is always going to deliver you from the storm. He wants to deliver you from every storm in your life, every bad thing, every hardship, every uh, financial crisis, every job loss, every heartache that you might have. Jesus is there to deliver you from it. And if you've existed for any amount of time, you know that that is not the case, even just from human experience, but also biblically speaking, that is not true. And yet that's one of the interpretations that I have seen in this text. Or perhaps maybe you would hear something like, God wants you to be able to walk on water. Now, obviously, that's also a figurative thing, meaning success. God wants you to do the impossible. He wants you to step out in faith. He wants you to, as you get older, start that business. He wants you to manifest that, that thing that you really desire. He wants you to walk on water. He wants you to have success. Now, these are just a few examples, and I don't mean to make light. I just want you to know that this is perhaps one of the most misinterpreted, misunderstood stories in all of the Bible. So what I want to do is use this as we go along as a test case. Okay, if those are wrong ways to interpret this, what is the right way? I, what are some principles that we can kind of pull out for good Bible study so that we don't think a boat is any more than just a boat? I had a professor in college, he, he always used to say in class, a boat is just a boat. Imagine that. A boat is just a boat. And sometimes water is just water. They're in a boat in water. That's the, the point of the story. And so the boat doesn't need to be some spiritual metaphor. Uh, there doesn't need to be these alternative meanings or these figurative phrases that we need to understand. There are ways for us to interpret this and get to the heart of what Mark is trying to get us to understand. So let's start with this. How do we study the Bible? If we just stepped back, how do we study the Bible in general in a way that's going to basically protect us from uh, having wrong interpretations or wrong conclusions from stories much like Mark 6 where Jesus walks on the water. Here's a simple Bible study tip, okay? When studying the Bible, you should ask first, 
What does this reveal and teach me about God? It's incredible. (laughs) That's the first question that you should ask. Now, it's important, and then we might chuckle, but that is so contrary to what often you might be even tempted yourself in reading the Scriptures, or perhaps in a broader uh, cultural way, that is not how people read the Bible. People will read the Bible, and they will ask, where am I in this story? Now, that's not an inappropriate question, but it is an inappropriate question to ask first. So we don't want to open our Bibles and say, where am I in this story? We don't want to say, where am I in the boat? We want to ask, what does this teach me and reveal to me about God? Because newsflash, the Bible is about who? It's about God. So we should ask, okay, when I'm reading a story, what does this reveal to me about who God is, about His character, about His nature? about the ways that he operates and interacts with his creatures, which are us, that he created us. What does this reveal to me about God? And if you keep that in the, in the forefront of your mind, that will protect you from misinterpreting much of Scripture. And then and only then, once you have asked that question and you've read the passage with that in mind, can you truly ask, what does this mean for me? Though there's an order to that. We ask, what does this show me? What does it reveal to me about who God is? And once we've got that firmly fixed in our mind, then we ask, okay, now that I know who God is, according to this passage, according to this book, according to this verse, what does that mean for me? We always want to look for the way that we are to respond or think of ourselves in light of who God is. And perhaps if you are someone that opens the Bible often and feels confused and feels like, what does this have to do with me? How is this applicable? How is this relevant? Maybe you are going to the Bible and asking, what does this mean for me or where do I fit in this text first? And perhaps that's why we often get confused because we try to interpret most of the Bible thinking, where am I in this text before we ever ask, where is God? I want you to think about that tonight as we go through this story, because as I've hopefully made clear, this story is not about limiting beliefs. It's not about walking in the miracle. It's not about living your best life and overcoming storms. It's not about any of those things. Uh, It's about something else entirely. And I'll just even, I guess, Uh, expose it for you here at the beginning. It's about understanding who Jesus is. This passage, and you'll see as we go along, is Jesus intentionally demonstrating for his disciples, his closest followers, who he is. The, The biblical word is revelation. Jesus is revealing who he is in a profound way, and he's doing it in a miraculous way. And he's doing it walking on water, certainly, but he's doing it for the purpose of showing and demonstrating to his disciples who he is, and by extension, for us this evening. So if you've got your Bibles, open to Mark 6. We're going to read the story together, verses 45 through 52, as we dive in and try to ask, where is God in this story, and what does it teach us about who God is? That's the first question. And then once we understand that, we ask, what does that mean for us in light of who God is. Let's read it together in verse 45. It says, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. Now, this was right after the feeding of the 5,000, which is what we talked about last week. Just as a quick recap, we talked about Jesus being humanity's greatest need, if you remember that. The humanity's greatest need wasn't the food that he was providing them, even though he was feeding them, humanity's greatest need was Jesus himself. That's what Jesus says in John 6. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever comes to me will never thirst, Jesus says. So in that story, again, it's not about Jesus just feeding people for the sake of feeding them. He's feeding them to show them they have a greater need that Jesus alone can satisfy. Jesus is the bread of life. So this is right after that. Immediately after that, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. Now I want you to keep that detail in your mind. Jesus at this point has only gone up to a mountain, so to speak, or a desolate place 
one other time in the Gospel of Mark to pray. So this is the second occurrence of that, and I want you to keep that in mind as we keep reading. So it says, after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. It's a strong wind. And about the fourth watch of the night, that's 3 to 6 a.m., this was the, the Roman way of keeping time. So 3 to 6 a.m., it says, The fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And he meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. This is a miraculous thing. Jesus makes the wind cease, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves. Now, that's interesting. Keep that in mind as well, because it connects this story to what we read last week, the story of Jesus feeding of the 5,000 with the bread, the loaves. He says, they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Now jump back up to verse 45. I want to slow down and read it again. Verses 45 and 46. Again, this comes right after the feeding of the 5,000. It says, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. So in the original language, this is a sense of urgency. It's like Jesus is shooing them away. He's just completed this miracle. They filled 12 baskets of abundance and overabundance of food and bread. They filled 12 baskets of leftovers. And right after that, it's like Jesus is kicking the disciples out saying, get out of here, go. And there's a sense of urgency. You need to leave quickly. That's why he says immediately he made his, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. So why is Jesus in such a hurry to dismiss his disciples? Why is he shooing them away? Why? He did just something miraculous, which by the way, his miracles are always intended to demonstrate something about himself. It's a, it's a revelation. Here's who I am. Here's my power. Here's my authority. Here's my message. So why is Jesus shooing his disciples away? Well, the gospel of John helps us with this. It's the same account, but it's John's perspective. John 6, 14 and 15. This is right after the feeding of the 5,000. Here's what it says. When the people saw the sign that he had done, this is the crowd, when they saw the sign that they had done, they said, this indeed is the prophet who is to come into the world. And perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself to pray. So John fills this out for us and basically lets us in on this sort of messianic revolt that was beginning to erupt, right? They, they just saw Jesus do something miraculous. They saw Jesus do something that only someone who was certainly associated with God or a prophet from God could do. And so they wanted to take Jesus, and they wanted a political revolution. They wanted Jesus to become their king. And Jesus, understanding that and recognizing that that was not why he was there, He was not there for a geopolitical revolution. He understood that. He takes his disciples and removes them from this messianic revolt that was beginning to swell. And that's important for us to start with because, again, we're asking the question, what does this teach us about God? Even by extension, what does this teach us about Jesus? What are we learning about Jesus through this? That they saw him, they wanted to make him king, and Jesus says, no, 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 that's not what I'm here for, shoes his disciples away, goes up on a mountain by himself, and begins to pray. He wants to make sure that the disciples don't get caught up in something that has nothing to do with why Jesus was there. And so that begs the question, why was Jesus there? What was Jesus doing? What was his mission? What was his message? What was his purpose? And that's something for all of us that we need to be clear on this evening. That's point number one. I want you to make sure that you're clear on Jesus's mission. Because as we've seen already in the Gospel of Mark, the disciples, they miss it. The crowd, they miss it. The crowd, they see these things that Jesus does, and they want to make him their king. 
They want to overthrow the Roman government. They want this geopolitical revolution. That's what they desire. And they had scriptural warrant for that, by the way. This didn't come out of anywhere. They have scriptural warrant for that, but Jesus makes it clear that is not why he is there. So there can easily be confusion about Jesus and about the things that he did and the reasons why he did the things that he did while he was on this earth. So I want you to make sure that you are clear on Jesus's mission. Why was he here? What was he trying to accomplish? Because here's what I'll tell you. Some people, even in a modern context, 2,000 years removed from Jesus being on earth, some people want Jesus to be genuinely a political leader. They want Jesus to be a political leader. They want Jesus to be a wise sage. They want Jesus to be a personal therapist. They want Jesus to be uh, an if-I-need-him add-on of some type. They want Jesus to be a permissive cheerleader where he just stands in the corner and says, go, 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 do, 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 whatever it is that you want to do. Have a great life. They want Jesus to be a permissive cheerleader. And here's what I can tell you. Your expectations of who Jesus is will shape your experience with Jesus. You need to understand that. Your expectations in your mind and in your heart, the things that you think about Jesus, the the ways that you think and the reasons that you give for the mission and ministry that he accomplished while he was on this earth, that will shape your experience with Jesus. And we read it in Mark chapter 6. How does it end in our story? It says, they did not understand about the loaves. Jesus walks on water And the rationale for them not understanding is not because Jesus is walking on water and that's weird and people don't do that. It's they didn't understand about the loaves because their hearts were hardened. They were missing it. Jesus is revealing things and teaching them things and they were missing it. Why? Because their expectations of who Jesus was were, were, were shaping their experience with Jesus. They couldn't see what was right in front of them. Now, I said I wanted you to to take note of that reality of Jesus praying and going up on the mountain to pray by himself. So I want to go back quickly to the first time that we see that because this is important. We see again this messianic revolt sort of happening where they want to take Jesus, they want him to be king, they want to overthrow the Roman Empire, they they want all of these things and Jesus says, no, that's not why I'm here, not at least in this moment, that's not my mission, that's not my purpose. He dismisses the disciples puts them in a boat, shoves them off the land and says, go, 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 get out of here. Then he himself dismisses the crowds and goes up on a mountain to pray. And the question is, why? Why is he doing that? Well, if you're in your Bibles, go to Mark chapter 1. I want you to see the first time that he did this. Mark 1, verses 35 through 39. This will help us to kind of see the pattern so far of Jesus getting away to pray and the rationale behind it. Mark 1, 35 through 39. If you're there with me, it says, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he, what does it say? He prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. Now, this is another example of Jesus going away to pray, And his disciples come to him, Simon Peter comes to him and says, Jesus, what are you doing? His expectations, again, are shaping his experience with Jesus. What are you doing? There's a sense of frustration on Peter's part. Why are you over here? There's people that are in need. There's people that need to be healed. There's people that are looking for you, he says. Everyone is looking for you, Peter says. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. We have two examples of Jesus going away by himself to pray. And again, if we're good Bible readers, that's part of what we're trying to discover tonight of how to do that. We're asking why. Why is he going away? Why is he praying? Well, both in Mark chapter 1 and Mark chapter 6, the answer is quite clear. There's three primary reasons why I see in these texts Jesus is going away to pray. And the first one is fellowship with his Father. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, has always been the Son of God. 
The Father has always been the Father, the Son has always been the Son. And part of that is Trinitarian doctrine that can be confusing and difficult to understand. But for our purposes, you need to understand Jesus went away to pray, to have fellowship, a sense of connectedness, if you will, with his Father. And he did that purposefully in Mark 1 and in Mark 6. And the purpose behind that was for alignment and focus with his Father's purpose for him on earth. Do you see the, the, the pattern there? In chapter 1, the disciples come up to him. Peter says, hey, what are you doing? People are looking for you. They're expecting things from you. And Jesus is off praying, aligning his focus with the Father's focus, aligning his purpose with the Father's pur- purpose. His alignment and focus is with his Father's purpose, and that's why he gets away to pray. And third, what goes along with that is Jesus goes away to pray for strength and power to complete the task that he had ahead of him, which if you've been in church for any amount of time, you know the task that he had ahead of him was dying on the cross, was paying for our sins, was drinking the cup of God's wrath. You remember the Garden of Gethsemane? He says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. That, that it's an illustration of the cup of wrath that God was going to pour out on Jesus for our sins. That's what Paul says. He made him who knew no sin to become sin. So Jesus is praying to, be, to have fellowship with his Father, to be in alignment with his Father's purpose, and for strength and power for the task ahead. So in Mark chapter 6, we're there. Remember, we're asking why is he praying? Because there was this groundswell of this messianic revolt where people wanted to make him king. And Jesus is saying, that's not why I'm here. At least right now in the way that you're thinking, your expectations are shaping and, and, and are clouding the ways that you're thinking about things. So Jesus gets away from the crowd and he prays to his father for alignment, for the, the actual purpose why he was there and for strength to accomplish it. And the purpose for why he came, I think, is summarized really, really well in John 10, verses 9 through 11. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came, here's his purpose, that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The disciples were looking for this grand political platform, but Jesus came to serve and not to be served. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. And Jesus going off on this mountain to pray is him getting in alignment with his father for the actual task that he was there to complete, which was not some geopolitical revolt. It was accomplishing salvation for mankind. And so it's important for us to have it fixed in our mind. We need to make sure that we are clear on Jesus's mission because our expectations of Jesus will shape our experience with him. And it can lead us to frustration it can lead us to disappointment. If you look at a, a, a story like Mark 6 where Jesus walks on the water and you think to yourself, Jesus is going to rescue me from every storm that I ever have, from every difficulty that I ever have, that's going to lead to disappointment, discouragement, and frustration because that is not what Jesus came to do. He came so that we might have life in him and yes, have it more abundantly in some sense so we can be blessed here in this life, not without trials or difficulty, but we certainly look forward to the next life where we will live with nothing but joy and great contentment in Christ Jesus. We need to make sure that we understand Jesus's mission. Now go back to Mark chapter 6 with me. Mark 6 Beginning of verse 17, let's pick it up. So as he had taken the leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray, right, to get away, to get in alignment, to 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 reestablish, so to speak, the purpose and the mission and the focus. It wasn't this messianic groundswell. It wasn't for him to be taken and to be forcibly placed as king to overthrow the Roman government in this time. And in verse 7, it says, When evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he, Jesus, was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. 
and he meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Now again, the question, the main question that we're asking in the text is, what does this reveal to us about God? What does this teach us about Jesus? And for all of what we just read, and we'll unpack it, we'll try to go through it here line by line so that we understand it, but we need to recognize, point number two, that Jesus makes the invisible God visible. That's what this story is about. That Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And the way that he interacts with his disciples, the way that he teaches, the way that he heals, the miracles that he performs, all of it is to demonstrate and to showcase that he is the image of the invisible God. Now, what does that mean? The Bible makes it clear that God dwells in unapproachable light. It says that no one has seen God. That if we were to see God, if we were to look in the the unfiltered glory of God, that we would be undone, like Isaiah says in Isaiah 6. And what Jesus does in this story and all throughout the Gospels is he makes the invisible God that dwells in unapproachable light, that is high and lifted up, he makes the invisible God visible through his ministry, through his interactions while he is on this earth. Recognize that, that Jesus makes the invisible God visible. So even in this text, what are we learning about the invisible God through Jesus? What are we learning about God? That's the question. We're not asking where we are in this story just yet. We're asking, what are we learning about God? What is Jesus revealing to us? What do we learn about God? Well, the first thing I see in this passage is that he is compassionate, that the God of the universe, the invisible God, made visible through Jesus, is a compassionate God, that he is tender, that he is loving, that he is compassionate. Now, we see that in verses 47 through 48. Look at it with me again. It says, and when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against him. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Now, I want to focus on that phrase, he saw that they were making headway painfully. Because again, if we're not astute Bible readers, we're going to pass over that. That seems like common language to us. But if you're a good Bible reader, here's another tip. You should be asking as you're reading, am I seeing repeated words or phrases? Because if you are, that's an indicator that something is being communicated in an important way. So where have we seen the phrase, and he saw before, that communicated passion or uh, compassion? Well, just back up to verse 34 in Mark 6, and here's what it says. When he went ashore, here's what it says, he saw a great crowd, and here's the connection, he had compassion on them. So Jesus is on the land. He's praying, he's communing with his father, and he looks out onto the sea, and he sees, somehow, it's dark, we don't know how he sees, supernatural, probably, he sees his disciples. And that's not just some detail about him seeing them from afar, it's communicating that he sees them in their distress, battling against the winds, and he has compassion on them. Why? Because God is a compassionate God. Just like in Mark 6, 34, it says, when he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Now he sees his disciples in the boat, out on the sea, fighting against the winds, being blown back to the south side of the Sea of the Galilee, and he has compassion on them because he cares for them. He loves them. That is what we learn about our God, that he is compassionate. The second thing that we learn, which is perhaps most obvious in this story, is that God is powerful that he is all-powerful. He has control over the spiritual and the physical. He has control over life itself, over every aspect of creation. He is powerful. And this is demonstrated by Jesus walking on the sea and making the winds cease. In fact, in verse 48, after he sees them and has compassion on them, 
It says, about the fourth watch, when he saw them, he began, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when he saw them, he was walking on the sea, literally, walking on water, which as you know, I've tried it. It doesn't work. We've all tried it, right? At the pool, we've all tried to see how far we can get. It doesn't happen. (laughs) We're all Peter drowning in the water, all right? But Jesus is walking on the water. Remember, the wind's blowing. So picture this. Waves are high. The disciples are being tossed like a little tiny sailboat in, in an ocean. I mean, that's what's happening. They're being tossed to and fro by the winds. Jesus just cruising, walking on the water. And then it says he gets into the boat in verse 51, and the wind ceased. And what's incredible about this story is that in Mark 4, he rebukes the wind and it ceases. In this, he says nothing, and the wind stops. Now, here's the point. God is powerful. He has control over all things. And here's another question. Did you know that in the Old Testament that God, the one that dwells in the unapproachable light, the invisible God that no one has seen, right, that God is referred to as walking on water? I don't know if you knew that. But in the Old Testament, the, the biblical writers refer to God as walking on water. Now, not in a literal sense, though Jesus did. In the Old Testament, they're basically just trying to communicate that who has the power to do something so incredible, to do something uh, so uh, rule-breaking in terms of uh, science or uh, physics or whatever you might say. Who has the power to do things that you cannot do? That's the point. It's God and God alone. In fact, in Psalm 77, verse 19, it says, Your way was through the sea, your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. God is so powerful that he walks on water. Job chapter 9, verse 8 says, Who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea? The question is rhetorical. It's meant to be, no one can do that but God. Job 38, 16, Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep like God has? Again and again and again, what we learn is that God is powerful. And that Jesus, demonstrating and revealing who God is, is showing us that God is compassionate and that God is powerful. Now, let's summarize all of this. The third, and I would say the most important thing that we learn about God is that, surprise of all surprises, at least for the first century Jews, was that Jesus is, in fact, God. Jesus is God. So he's revealing, he's compassionate, he's revealing and showcasing his power, but even beyond that, he's revealing that Jesus is God. Hebrews 1, he's the radiance of his glory, the exact imprint of his nature, Jesus is God. Now, if you read this and you're like, ah, well, he doesn't say that, well, let me show you, let me show you. Let's read it together. Look at verse 48. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch, 3 to 6 a.m., he came to them, walking on the sea. Only God can do that. He meant to pass by them. Now, again, if we're not astute Bible readers, we're going to say, what in the world? Jesus was just going to cruise right on by the disciples as they were floating around in this little sailboat, winds beating against it. What a savage. Like, he was just going to be like, sorry, guys, I'm on my way. I just, fed, I just fed you bread. What else do you want? No, that's not what that phrase means. It's, it says he meant to pass by them. And then if you skip down even to verse 50, he says, for they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Now we'll get to the, he passed by them in a second. Let's first talk about this phrase, take heart, it is I. Now I don't want to be too technical, but in the original language, the Greek here is ego eimi. Everyone say ego eimi. Ego eimi. It means I am. That's the basic literal translation of ego eimi. So what is Jesus is saying here is that he is the great I am. As he's walking on the water, he says, take heart, don't fear, be calm. There's no reason to be afraid. Why? Because I am, I am the great I am. Now, where do we get that? Exodus 3 verse 14, God said to Moses, God, the invisible God who dwells in unapproachable light. Here's what he says. I am who I am. And he said, say this to your people of Israel, I am has sent you. So Jesus walking on water, he goes up to them. He says, hey, go Amy. He says, I am. He's saying, I am the invisible God in flesh. Jesus makes the invisible God who dwells in unapproachable light 
visible on earth. He demonstrates his compassion, demonstrates his power, and he shows that ultimately he is God. He is the great I am. That's the phrase that he uses. Now let's get back to the phrase where he says he meant to pass by them. This is not Jesus being rude. This is not Jesus ignoring them. This was a phrase, again, astute Bible readers, that was seen again and again and again in the Old Testament that connected the actions of God to his covenant people. Let me read you just a couple of verses. This is Exodus 33, verse 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness, here's the phrase, pass before you and will proclaim before your name, before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. That same phrase. Even in Exodus 33, 22, it says, And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Here's the pattern. In the Old Testament, the covenant-keeping God, the I Am, that's His name, with His people, He's revealing who He is, and he's rescuing his people. Do you see that? In verse 19, he says, I will make all my goodness pass before you, revealing who he is, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy, revealing and rescuing. Verse 22 in Exodus 33 says, and while my glory passes by, revealing, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by, rescuing. I will reveal and I will rescue. So when Jesus is walking and he meant to pass by the disciples, what he's doing is he's revealing who he is and he's intending to rescue them as we know that he does. One author put it this way, but when Jesus passes by the disciples on the lake, he does something differently from the revelation of God in the Old Testament. He intends to make the mysterious and enigmatic, basically the the invisible God of Job, visible and palpable as it had not been and could not have been to former generations. As Jesus is passing by, he's revealing and he's going to rescue. He's revealing that he is the great I am. Now here's the question. Jesus reveals who he is to the disciples, that he truly is God, that he is the great I am. I and the Father have one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's what Jesus says. Jesus reveals who he is to the disciples. How do they respond. What is their response? That's all in. Look at verse 51 and 52. This incredible story happens, and he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. Rescue. Jesus reveals, I am. Take heart. He rescues. The winds ceased, and they were utterly astounded. And that sounds positive. Way to go, disciples. You get it. You're worshiping. Well, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Now, just even another interesting thing. I thought about this earlier today. When we started chapter 6, which was forever ago, Jesus came to his own town, Nazareth, and was rejected by his own people. They didn't understand who he was. They didn't understand his message. They didn't understand anything about him. Now we've got his disciples. They've spent time with him. They've seen his miracles. They've been around the campfire with him. And this chapter basically bookends with his own disciples, his own people in Nazareth. They don't understand. They reject his own disciples. They don't understand who he is because his, their hearts are hardened. Now, what's sort of the, the climax, putting all of these things together? What's the response? This is what we're asking. What does this mean for me? We started with, what does this reveal about God? He's compassionate. He's powerful. Jesus is God. Now, what does this mean for me? Point number three, trust in Jesus to be delivered from the storm. Trust in Jesus to be delivered from the storm. And the storm, in this sense, I'm taking to be sin and death. Trust in Jesus to be delivered from the storm of sin and death. Not from just difficulty in your life, not from hardship or heartache, but from sin and death, which is why Jesus came. He came to forgive uh, those who would believe in his name. He came to seek and to save the lost, is what the Bible says. Trust in Jesus to be delivered from the storm. Now, again, we started with these bad interpretations. The boat somehow represents limiting beliefs, right? Step out into the miracle. God wants you to be able to to walk on water. He wants you to have success, or God will deliver you from every storm in your life. Well, no, here's the point. Here's the point. There's been two times in the Gospel of Mark that the disciples have been separated from Jesus. 
Actually, ironically, both of them were in a boat and both of them involved a storm. Mark chapter 4, don't go fishing, that's the, the moral of the story. Mark chapter 4 and Mark chapter 6. Two times the disciples separate from Jesus, they're both in a boat, or in some sense, Jesus was, all, was with them, but he was below in chapter 4, and in chapter 6 they were separated. Both times they are met with crisis, and both times Jesus rescues and delivers them. That's the point of this story. He reveals who he is, and he rescues his people from their imminent destruction. And even in a spiritual sense, he rescues us from our destruction. You see, because a life without Jesus leads to being overcome with the storm of sin and death. And only when Jesus, and only with Jesus, can you find safety, security, and deliverance. Well, he just did all that work. Who is God? Who is Jesus? Jesus, what is his purpose? He came to seek and to save. He came to provide life. He came to give life and to, to make a way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's his focus. He reveals who he is, the great I am, and then he delivers his people. And as you read a story like this, the, the way that the Bible would have you to respond is to see Jesus for who he is, who he has revealed himself to be, the great I am, and to trust that in him and in him alone, you can be delivered from the storm of sin and death, that you will not be separated from God for eternity when you die, but rather you will be with God. You will enjoy a right relationship with God. That's the point of this story. It shows us who Jesus is, that he truly is God and what he came to to do, to deliver his people from the storm of sin and death. And your response is to trust in Jesus to be delivered from that storm. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for these words in Mark chapter 6. Thank you just for the clarity of all of the different allusions and, uh, Father, just the clear examples of Jesus making it clear that he is God, that he makes the invisible God visible through his life on earth. He demonstrates compassion and, and power and invites us into a relationship with you. And so, Father, I pray for the people in this room that I know are much like the disciples that have hard hearts, that either have expectations of Jesus that are not true to who he is, or perhaps are just an all-out rebellion and rejection against Jesus. Father, help us not to be like the disciples, to, to see Jesus as he is, as he has revealed himself to be, and yet continue in unbelief. Father, help us to believe. Help the people in this room that don't believe to believe. Open their eyes. Help them to experience deliverance from the storm of sin and death. Father, you sent your son to be sin who knew no sin so that we could have a right relationship with you. We could be the righteousness of God in Christ. So Father, help us as we discuss these things. I pray that even some of the principles of studying the Bible would stick as we would begin each time that we open the Bible to ask, who are you? Who are you revealing yourself to be? How are we learning about your nature and your character? And then from there, once that question has been firmly answered, we can, then, we can answer with confidence who we are in light of who you are. So Father, help us this evening with that discussion. Help us to, to believe and to experience the deliverance that Jesus offers to all of those who place their faith and trust in him. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.